for tonight's adventure with the fat man. Okay, here we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time of day it is, I hope it's good to be where you are because I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Baltimore Fats, and this is part two of PsyOp City. <laughs> okay. As I said in part one, I went off on a tangent that I decided to turn into part two here. So I pick up with a little bit of that other take and then run with it. So I hope you enjoy this one, guys. The very first time I ever thought I was going to do a video was I watched a video. I don't even remember now who the guy was, but he was a flat earth guy. And he did a video about science fiction and the introduction of science fiction through, you know, Jules Verne and H.G. Wells and things like that. And, and it was great. And I've been a, well aware of the use of science fiction my whole life. My father was a massive, massive science fiction collector. And he um, knew very many science fiction writers. And I spent a good deal of my childhood around science fiction and fantasy writers and artists. And so after that, after watching that video and, I, and having the sort of background that I have in some of this, and believe me, I, it pained my father that I never got into science fiction, I'm sure, at some, on some level. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. <laughs> I love it. I really do, but not like he did. <laughs> and, and so after watching that video and having the background that my father gave me in science fiction, I knew about this guy. And so I always felt that the, like the videos that explored that topic never went far enough because they didn't know this guy, Paul Meyer and Anthony Leinbarger, whose pen name was Cordwainer Smith. And Cordwainer Smith was a very influential early pulp science fiction writer. But not only that, he was an expert in psychological warfare and he died in Baltimore. <laughs> All right. And he went to Johns Hopkins. And so I'm going to do that video someday, but I just want to add, you know, why is it important that these, that science fiction looks the way that it does? It was laid out to do so by, and, and when they say expert in psychological warfare, he literally wrote the book. And here it is, <laughs> The Manual for Psychological Warfare by Paul M. A. Leinbarger. And I'm not going to talk about this yet. We're going to come back to it. But there's just a couple quick things I wanted to point out. All right, first is that he dedicates it to his wife, which I think is very sweet. But I don't know what it says about their marriage that he would dedicate the Manual of Psychological Warfare to her. <laughs> but that he goes, also that he goes out of his way to point out that this is a product of field experience. And he says it here and then again repeats it right down here, the product of experience rather than research. So practical knowledge. You know, he was on the front lines of all of this stuff. He was the minister of psychological warfare for the United States government from the 1940s through the 1960s. And we're going to talk about that. But like, who is this guy? <laughs> and I mentioned that he was my dad's, one of my dad's favorite writers. And so my dad, being a teenager in the mid-50s, you know, really got into the science fiction pulps and stuff. And he had, unfortunately, I no longer have, um, but he had decades long runs of the of Galaxy magazine. I mean, he must have had every one from 1955 to 1973 or something like that. You know, and a couple of other magazines were his favorites too. Um, but Galaxy was definitely one of them. Fantasy and science fiction was one. Um, and, you know, so I knew about Cordwainer Smith and, it came out, it didn't come out that he was, that the science fiction writer was the same as, or, or was a pseudonym for Paul Leinbarger, who was the Minister of Psychological Warfare. That came out after his death in 66. So my father had been reading his stories for many years. And so I'm sure it must have blown his mind when it came out, because he really wouldn't stop talking about it in his finer moments. <laughs> He would get on his science fiction rants and his blues rants and early rock and roll rants <laughs> that, uh, you know, he would talk about Cordwainer Smith having written the manual for psychological warfare. And so this is something that I always had in my pocket going back to, you know, my earliest teen years. I'm, you know, I can't imagine he would tell us, talk to us about that stuff any before then, but um, he probably did actually. <laughs> but, um, and so when I would see these videos about, you know, science fiction and how they set it all up. I'm like, no one is talking about Cordwainer Smith. Like, how is that possible? Right? I mean, because he had a very small, more cultish audience. 
as a science fiction writer. Now, I cannot, I'm not qualified because, as I said, I did not read this book. <laughs> Although I did read the introduction prepping this video, and there's a great bit in there that I'm going to talk about. But, you know, so I just want to, I just want to touch base. I cannot get too much into it. It's like, but this guy's life is amazing. Look at him. Right, Minister of Psychological Warfare for the United States government. Here we go. <laughs> and to find out about him, we really need to start with his dad. Right, And it starts with this article here in Johns Hopkins Magazine. And just making a quick couple points here about, you know, he dies at Johns Hopkins. He was a Hopkins alum, graduates with a PhD at the age of 23. You know, that's pretty good. All right, And so that's why when we get to this article here that discusses his father, Right, it's from Johns Hopkins Magazine, right? Because he was an alum, right? And it's called Throngs of Himself. And I love that they use the word throngs, of course, because it comes up so much in, in the Baltimore Sun of the Jubilee era. <laughs> throngs of Himself. And that means, they, and they use that because he has so many hats, right? He does so many things. And he writes under so many different pseudonyms, all different types of works, nonfiction, fiction, science fiction, right? He's all over the map. And of course, this, the Manual for Psychological Warfare, let's not forget that one. <laughs> and let's get into his birthright, because who could this be, right? What kind of life did this guy live, right? And it starts with his father, Paul Myron Wentworth Leinbarger, right? Who led a globe-trotting, service-minded life his son would emulate, right? He's senior was the son of a minister, and I love how common this is, right? How um, so many of these important people were sons of ministers, right? And so he was sent to Europe at age 18, 16, rather, where he studies at the University of Heidelberg, one of the oldest universities in Europe. <laughs> All right, and he earns a law degree at, at the University of Madrid, and he serves as a lieutenant in the Spanish American War. Right, but it's his, it's his specialized knowledge of Spanish law that earns him appointment as a judge in the Philippines, which was newly seized American colony at the time. Or so I guess the Philippines were under Spanish control. I don't understand the history of the Philippines there. Where he meets Sun Yat-sen, a young revolutionary seeking funds and support from Chinese expatriates to overthrow the Qing dynasty. Right, while the details of this meeting are largely unknown, he would be it would be a radical turning point in the judge's life. In 07, 1907, he resigns his judicial post to become Sun's legal advisor and financial backer. And so in June 1913, he sends his pregnant wife, Lillian, <laughs> Lillian Bearden, Lillian Beard, Beard, Lillian Lilith Beard, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> from their home in the Philippines till Milwaukee so that their child would be a natural born American citizen and therefore be eligible one day for US presidency. So senior here has designs on his kid to be president. And with this kind of background and knowledge that he has, he must know that only the elite become the president or bloodline people. So he either understands the bloodline connections or he understands that he can create an elite enough son to become president. But of all the places to send them, why Milwaukee? And so I had to look real quick. <laughs> and of course, right, the first Europeans to pass through the area were French Catholic Jesuit missionaries. <laughs> okay, so Milwaukee's a Jesuit founded town. You know, enough said. Right? <laughs> hey, why did he send them to Milwaukee? Because they were Jesuits in Milwaukee. Right? <laughs> and what were the Jesuits responsible for? The scientific revolution. <laughs> And what did Gord Wainer Smith end up writing? Science fiction, right? <laughs> right, but so he's born. And so all of this is happening at a time of the Xinhai Revolution, which will install Sun, Yat Sun Yat-sen as the first president of the Republic of China. And he's financially backed by Gord Wainer Smith's dad. <laughs> And so when Cord Wainer Smith is born, uh, junior, right, he gets christened by uh, Sun Yat-sen, Lin Ba Lo, Forest of Incandescent Bliss, and is his godson, which is absolutely amazing. Right now, I have no idea what's going on in China or anything like that at the time, this Chinese revolution and what happens with all that, but, you know... You know that communist China plays a 
a part of this coming up, you know, with Chairman Mao in, in the 40s and, you know, that pre-World War II and post-World War II era, right? And so looking further for his dad, right, is that he was um, advisor to Sun Yat-sen, 1907 to 1925, and then legal advisor to the national government of China from 1930 to 1937, you know, those pre-World War II prime years, right? And so when Cordwainer Smith is born, right, he gets, he travels around a lot and he earns his degree from Johns Hopkins at 23, like I, I think I said, right? And he serves, he gets a faculty appointment. He, like, he's a genius, right? And having the background that he has in this uh, Southeast Asian foreign affairs and propaganda techniques, right? He has his faculty appointment at Duke in Far Eastern Affairs. But while he's there, he serves as second lieutenant in the army where he's involved in the creation of the uh, Office of War of Information. And he was sent to China to coordinate military intelligence operations in 1943, right? The beginning part of the war. I mean, we're in Germany here. We're not fighting the Pacific theater yet, where he becomes a close confidant of Chiang Kai-shek. And now Chiang Chai Chiang Kai-shek serves as leader of the Republic of China between 1928 and 1975. Unbelievable that Cordwainer Smith would be a close friend of this guy. All right, that's how connected he was to what was going on in Southeast Asia and during the World War II era there. Right? And they talk about that further here. And so while he's over there, right, he you know, recalls his youth and the effectiveness of the communist propaganda that was floating around uh, during that, and that it was the pamphlets and radio broadcasts that transformed communist guerrilla victories against the Japanese into patriotic triumphs. Right? And he called it strong black magic. And we're going to get a little bit more into that in a second, too. And so during the war, he's stationed in India and China, serving as a linguist, propagandist, and liaison between Chinese and U.S. intelligence. By the end of the conflict, Leinbarger had been promoted to major and became a self-proclaimed visitor to small wars, right? because he would go and help these people with their psychological warfare departments and their propaganda. Right? In Malaysia, he ran psychological warfare operations for the British, right? fighting Chinese-led communist guerrillas. All the while, still friends with Chiang Kai-shek. <laughs> and it's unbelievable. I, you know, I don't understand the nature of America's dealings in Southeast Asia. And so he helps the American government all through the Korean, up through the Korean War, but he refuses to help in Vietnam. And so after the war, he moves back to the States and he transfers from Duke to Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, where he writes the manual, because <laughs> I'm sure they asked him to. Right? And in the 50s, he consults in Korea, where he accomplishes his, his, his person, for him personally what he considered his greatest propagandist feat. Late in the conflict, the Chinese were trying to surrender, right? but they couldn't drop their weapons because to do so would have been dishonorable. And so they were coming out into the fields with their guns in their hand, and the so and Americans were just the American soldiers believing they were still under attack would open fire and kill the surrendering Chinese. And so Leinbarger met with Chinese prisoners and devised a series of Chinese words which were culturally acceptable, words like love, virtue, and humanity, that did not insult the soldiers' honor, but when said together were phonetically similar to the English words "I surrender." Pamphlets with explicit surrender instructions were dropped behind enemy lines. So he was able to significantly reduce the number of surrendering Chinese soldiers' deaths, you know, just with the use of phonetics, right? That's unbelievable. And right? so after the Korea War, he comes home and he starts teaching for the government. He starts teaching these psychological warfare techniques using his textbook. <laughs> it says his academic activity provides a convenient cover for his continued work in psychological warfare. And in his book, Portrait of a Cold Warrior, this former CIA operative, Joseph Bookholder Smith described a seminar for CIA operatives that Leinberger taught at his Washington home. Going to Paul Leinberger's house on Friday evenings was not only an educational experience, it was also an exercise in clandestinity. And each seminar was limited, limited to no more than eight students. You know, when operatives were told to pose as students from the School of Advanced International Studies to go to Paul's via different routes and to say they were attending a seminar on Asian politics. Right, 
is so he was working for the CIA using his psychological warfare textbooks and teaching these t techniques to CIA operatives. <laughs> and so what's in this book? <laughs> We're just going to get to the chapters. You know, historic examples of psychological warfare. And, and the best part is, is this, this webpage, it's all you could just click on in one of these chapters and go read it if you wanted, right? You know, the function of, the definition of, the limitations of, all right? Examples in World War One and Two. Right, analysis, intelligence, the organization for, right, the organization for, the plans and planning, operations for civilians, operations against troops, you know, after World War II, right, to the present day for them, which would have been the military psi war operations of 1950 to 53. You know, they have, all the illustrations are annotated, right, this is as one of the outstanding leaflets of the war, right, and it's, um, you know, prepared in 1945 for distribution by B-29s operating over Japan, this leaflet lists the 11 Japanese cities which were marked for destruction, right? The 11 Japanese cities marked for destruction. And so they drop these pamphlets in to all of these cities, and it lets the people know, hey, you better get out of Dodge, because we're about to bomb the crap out of you, right? And, you know, it's because it says it's calling on Japanese citizens, civilians, to save their own lives. Right? At the same time, it had the effect of shutting down 11 strategically important cities, right? hurting the, the Japanese war effort, while giving Americans a reputation for humanity, and also refuting enemy charges that we undertook indiscriminate bombing. They so they told them, here it is, we're coming, and we're coming to destroy your country, these 11 cities, Clear them out, all right? <laughs> That's unbelievable. You know, the basic form of propaganda says right here, leaflets, all right? Pictures and some words, you know, on paper that people can read, you know, what is that? <laughs> it is basic propaganda, the most basic propaganda that there is, right? And they feed it to us every day. And <laughs> Man, unbelievable. All right, and so, you know, so this guy goes on to write these science fiction. And so I'll, you know, I'll leave a link for you guys, <laughs> so for you guys to read this. But, you know, so I just wanted to point out, too, now, that this was written for the School of Advanced International Studies, which is still a school today for Johns Hopkins University. <laughs> Here it is. All right. <laughs> And there's never been a more exciting time to study international relations at a graduate school with a proven reputation for producing influential, innovative, and accomplished graduates. <laughs> and the school is, is strategically located in D.C., Europe, and China. <laughs> I wonder who set that up in China for them, right, in D.C. Hey, but where is the one in Europe? Where is the European campus, right? S-A-I-S Europe. And so where, where is SAIS Europe? <laughs> it's in Bologna. And what else is in Bologna? <laughs> the oldest university in the world. <laughs> I don't know. But that says to me that perhaps psychological warfare and propaganda have been coming out of the, old, the oldest university in the world <laughs> since the very beginning. <laughs> if there's a connection to the, the School of Advanced, to the School of Advanced international studies, right, and the Department of Psychological Warfare for the U.S. Army, or the U.S. military, right, and the publication of this book, which was written for this organization, the School of Advanced International Studies, you know? So why is it important that the results of science in these space agencies mirror what science fiction looks like? It couldn't be because it's all psychological warfare, could it? <laughs> Okay, there's so much more to do on this subject and the history of science fiction, and I'm going to touch more on that sooner than later, I'm sure, because it all comes down to psyops. Everything does at this point, right? And the, the scariest part is, is that they don't care that that information is out there to be known. They don't care. You can find this book easily. It's there for free. You can read it. You know, Johns Hopkins doesn't hide its relationship with it by publishing this article. Right? You know? <laughs> and so, anyway. <laughs> I, 
hope you enjoyed this one, guys. There's more to come. <laughs> Until the next one, cheers.